I got to tell you, these are the days that I actually live for. And if you take a look at the market, it's uh, been somewhat turbulent with a good amount of downplay. But I got to tell you, right now, I think is the time to be in here where we're at right now. And I'm going to tell you why. So first of all, we take a look at the fear and greed index. We can see that right now, because of the monstrous dip that we had in over the last couple of days or so, we're down to about a 30. Now, this isn't at extreme fear right now. I'd like to see more of that. But uh, we're not there yet. But I think what we really need to do is just take a look at a little bit of history about where we were at and where we're going. There's this great chart on uh, Ben's site over into the Cryptoverse. And it takes a look at the Bitcoin monthly returns. And what I'm looking at here, because, I mean, we can go through it line by line, year by year. But I'm always looking at uh, the years that correspond to what happens. So usually, like we talk about in the four-year cycles, it all starts off essentially with, a halving, then you go to an all-time high, then a dip and a reset. Then you go through a halving, all-time high, dip and reset. This has happened in for the halving in 2012. Then you had an all-time high in 2013. You had a dip in 2014 and a reset in 2015. And it happened in 2016 for a halving, 2020 in a halving, and 2024 also in the halving. So what I want to take a look at is this is just month to month. What I want to do is break this down and really just show you just kind of where we're at right now and what's happening. So for this year. It's been a little bit different, I will say, because obviously because of the Bitcoin ETF. And we can see that uh, for February 2024, we had a 44%, roughly 43.95%, as it says here, as an appreciation. And then we went into March, April saw a bit of a slump, then May, and then June. And June right now, we're, we're kind of eating it, let's be honest. And uh, we're in that uh, downward slump that I, I think that uh, I'm comfortable with right now. So let's take a let's take a little bit of look back 2020, 2020 2016. So what I'm going to do is we're taking a look at those having years. Let's look forward. We can we already know that it's it's kind of in the same way 2020 2016 as far as like what's happened. You had three or four months of green. You had, had two or three of uh, of, but coming forward, looking to the next six months: July, August, September, October, November, December. In 2020, you had five great months. And this was nothing to be overstated. We had a great amount of green months, except for September, which September, and we talked about this on many a time, historically is the worst month, not just in crypto, but in traditional markets. But take a look at even 2016, when things were really much immature. We only had two bad months, and it wasn't even that bad. It was negative 7% in July and negative 8% in August. Now, going before that, we had a pretty monstrous uh, uh, time frame in 2016. But the next four months were great. Again, we take a look at 2020, just to kind of rewind here. You just had one month in September, which was pretty negative. But look at October, November, and December. So when I see these types of things, I'm like, this is actually very good. I like what I'm seeing, especially moving forward, because if I want to get into Bitcoin, I got to tell you, this is not a bad time to do it. But there is something that people will always say, which is, Rob, that you don't understand. Because in 2020, you know, we had COVID and, you know, there was uh, rates were flat and there was just uh, and it went down to zero. And then, of course, the money printing. Well, hold on. Let's take a look at that real quick, because everybody's talking about these federal funds rates. And of course, yes, we would like to see some some rate cuts. But is it absolutely necessary? I'm going to tell you right now. No, it's not. Here's what we have. We were at zero for, I mean, pretty much a decade going from like 2009, 2016. I'll say seven years or so. But what we did is we saw a little bit of a rate increase or a federal funds rate. And then that was in 2016. And look what happened all the way here in 2017. Was that not the all time high? Like we talked about, there is a halving. There is then the next year is an all time high, then a dip and a reset. Well, look at this. We still hit all time highs and we were still increasing the federal funds rate. Were we not? That's the same thing. So now let's go to 2020. We all know about the Cervasa sickness. And of course, it dropped. We were holding study. Then, of course, it dropped off the planet. We were, we were zero for quite some time. And people say, well, that was the reason, Rob. That was the reason because of federal funds rate and the money supply. Hold on. Yes, we were a zero for quite some time. And that's true. And of course, we had the highest performing traditional market, S&P 500. Stock markets went through the roof. Crypto went through the roof. Although I got to tell you, I think we got screwed out of a uh, proper bull run. I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you mostly because of the FTX, the leverage, the Celsius, the Voyagers, and the nonsense that were going on in the background. But I guess 
if we take a look here, as far as the federal funds rate, what do we see? Yes, it did start to go up in 2022. And yes, that actually did happen. But as a reminder, just to jog everybody's memory, uh, our federal funds rate is five and a quarter. Did we not see a 3X essentially in the last year? If we go back to take a look at the Bitcoin price, from a year ago, you're at 25,000. What were we at today? We're at 60,000. Did we not hit 73,000? We hit 73,000, even though the federal funds rate was the highest it's been since 2007. So I know when people say, well, the federal funds rate and, and whatever else, look, even if it stays here, I'm okay with that because at some point they're going to cut. They're going to cut at some point, And guess what they're going to do? Turn on the money printer. But let's take a look at that M2 money supply. So again, Yes, America, we love to print money. We're very good at it, actually. But we can just see here that, yes, in 2016, we had quite a bit of a, of a jump. That's what we do. We print money, 2013, 2014, 2015. This keeps going up and up and up. The 2017, of course, we had an all-time high. Now, if we come back to here, we take a look at 2020. There wasn't really much going on. Then we had the cerveza sickness. And what do we have? Well, we had the most amount of money printing we've ever done in the history of the United States. So we've come over here to 14.5 trillion, all the way up to 21.615 trillion. That's a lot. But I remind you again, look at where we're at right now. The rates are the highest they've been since 2007. The M2 money supply actually has decreased. The money printers were turned off. And did we not go, like I said, from 25,000 to 73,000? What do you think is going to happen when the funds rate, they start to cut the rate for next year and the money printer gets turned on? I got to tell you, if you don't think this is the right time to invest, then I don't know really what to tell you because I can't tell you anything. I can't give a financial advice. I'm not your dad. I'm not a financial advisor. Of course, you can do what you want to. But I got to tell you, things I think to what I feel are just lining up. So again, if we take a look at where we've been, yes, the first six months were pretty darn good, actually. And we've had a couple of red months. I feel like we could have a couple of red months here. And that to me is only opportunity. But I want you to focus on where we were at in the last two halving cycle years. We had five green months in 2020 and one red. We had four monstrous green months in green and only two negative. Focused on that. And then lastly, I will say like this, there's a certain indicators I like to take a look at, the NUPL, the net unrealized profit and loss. And we're taking a look at this, it's the market value uh, and realized value. Market value is the current price of Bitcoin, realized value takes the price of each Bitcoin when it's last moved. It's just a good indicator that, we, that I personally use of when I want to accumulate and when I want to actually sell the crypto or Bitcoin and other altcoins. But we can see here that right now we peaked out, gosh, around March 14th, somewhere around, around that point. And now we're kind of coming down into that optimism, anxiety, and then we'll probably break down into the hope and fear if this keeps continuing on for the sideways chop. But I still stay. It's a pretty good time to actually accumulate. And then we've got also market value, risk realized value, and the Z-score, which kind of takes up the noise. I just want, I just found this interesting. Because first of all, we're pretty darn low. And when things are low, that's when you want to buy. You want to buy up here? Probably not. That's what most people do. And we're not most people. But when I took a look at this, and I took a look at, again, the halving years, 2016, taking a look at June 16th, 2016. What do we see? We had a big run up, just like we did this year. And what do we have? A big pullback. And then what happens? Keeps going up. Now in 2020, it didn't do it as much as that if we come back here to june there was a little bit of a drop off then an up then down and then it took off and over here i think this is almost lining up like 2016 correct me where i'm wrong in the comment section and if that's the case i'd like to see a 2017 because 2017 bitcoin went from roughly a thousand dollars in january to almost twenty thousand in december and if we're lining up for the exact same thing or relatively close i like my odds of where things are going and again if we come back over here to to May going into June, and then we had a big drop off. What happened in 2016? Same type of thing. And then it just started to rally up. I'm not saying it's going to do that. 
I'm just saying that I think I like what I'm looking at right now, and this is the opportunity that I personally was waiting for. But you also have to say to yourself, well, Rob, what else would I be looking at? Well, the great thing about Ben's site, and I, unfortunately for Ben, I steal all his information, but if you'd like to get more, there's a link in the description for his site, fantastic website. You only want to take a look at the risk levels. And right now, and we talked about this many times, there's actually a link in the description where I talk about using risk levels to get in and out of your positions. If I take a look at Bitcoin, it's actually not really that risky, 0.56. I'm looking at different cryptos that maybe are in the fours or the threes, still kind of risky, 0.35 for Aave and so on and so forth. You can make your decision here, but I got to tell you, as these risk levels start to go down, that's when you want to start to look at it and go, is this a good opportunity for me? Do I like the fundamentals of this project? Should I get into it? I think for some of these, the answer could be yes for you, but you have to do your research and really dive into it. And that'll lead me to the last piece also is if we're going to talk about top 10, top 20 different cryptos, there's also other things that, to get into. Now, I love a good meme coin because I like to gamble every so often. It's okay to gamble every so often, it is. There's a, there's a place for this, it's called Las Vegas. Also, we do this online with the different meme coins that are on different uh, platforms. But the problem with meme coins and gambling is that if you do it every day, you're become a degenerate. And you become a degenerate, and then what are you doing? You're a degenerate gambler, and you're begging for Satoshis on the street. I don't want you to do that. I want you to actually get into different projects that actually do something and have real world utility. I've been talking about Minutes Network for three months now, and there were some things I could not tell you because I was under contract to not tell you. I was given access to the individuals that put together Minutes Network. We did a great video. There's a link in the description where I did a deep dive on it. But one of the things that I knew but I couldn't tell was that they had a partnership with, first of all, a government agency, and I still can't tell you who it is. The second one is that they made a partnership with SEW. You know who SEW is? They are a massive global company. They do everything from power, gas, water, energy, solar, smart cities, and e-mobility. They have 1.2 billion customers, which right now, of correct me in the comment section, I think we're hovering around 8 billion people. And they have a partnership with them. And then also on top of that, like I said, about the governments. And what I want you to do is take a look at this project the TGE is going on right now. Americans can invest into this. And really what it's doing, it's using apps and SDKs to allow access for anybody in the entire world to communicate with anybody else with the different apps that are available and a new method of funding. But right now, they need, they need nodes, they need validators, they need switch nodes. That's where you come in. To make more sense of this, again, watch the deep dive video, link in the description. I think this one could be massive, and that's it for today. So look, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. That's it for today. Thanks so much for stopping by, I appreciate it, and I'll see you on the next one.